The Fuji Cast is an independent loading zone production. Kevin, I know it's a few weeks in, but um, I've kind of I've, I've managed to I've managed to hold on to the uh, the concept of, of what I decided to do. It's gratitude year this year. See, I'm making sure this year to try and write a note of thank you or gratitude to at least one person a day. Sometimes, sometimes longhand. Well, I haven't had one yet. <laughs> well, <laughs> well it, it is only February. <laughs> I'll get round to yours. So I saw this guy on YouTube, uh, Thomas Jones in Germany. I can't understand, um, I was going to say a lot of his work, but let's be honest, any of his work, because it's in German, except the titles. Unless, of course, I'm, I'm managing to read German. I'm thinking my, my tiny mind here, oh, I understand that. I just can't understand it when it's being spoken. We, we did German. Did you do German at school? I did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> ich möchte eine Bier, bitte. Yeah, all your, all your linguistic talent seems to be uh, centred around being able to order a beer. Yeah. 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 But um, anyway, I wanted to give uh, Thomas Jones a mention. His videos are superb. He's a Fujifilm shooter. Look him up on YouTube. In, in, in terms of uh, context and the grading, the overall softness of light, where, whereas my own are kind of like chiselled and harsh in the studio, I'm like one of those concrete statues without the large appendage. But uh, I think his, um, his videos are really good. Have a look. Um, so I reached out just to say how, how much I liked what he did despite the language barrier. And he, and he wrote back. And it turns out he's a bit of a Mullins fan. Oh. So there, there was, there, this was going somewhere. He's heard the podcast. No. Oh. Hey, Neil, if you get a chance, say hello to Kevin Mullins for me. I wrote a book about JPEG recipes for the Fujifilm cameras and named one of the recipes after him. Huh. Because after all, he is kind of at fault for my switch to Fujifilm and the great journey that I'm on. If he wants a copy, I'll be happy to send one. That is, if he's interested in a German book about stuff he probably already knows. <laughs> uh, let's stay in touch. Yeah. He knows, knows what the future brings. So, yes, yes, Absolutely. send it, send it, send it. That's very, it's not a very German name, is it? Thomas Jones. Uh, well, Thomas is. Oh, Thomas. Yes. Thomas. Okay. Um, but, uh, yeah, but you're now a recipe. You're like a proper brand and all that. <laughs> I'm you? a recipe. You're a recipe. Yes. Well, you know, because you have recipes for all of, your, your settings. A, a don't? pinch of Kev's arm, <laughs> an, a, a, a nip of the say. eyebrows. <laughs> But you know when you have your black and white recipes and things like that for your your presets. Yeah, well, I named all mine after people like John Merwitz. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, Darcy now, Padilla. But th this is nice to know you are a recipe. Yeah. I mean, you're like the Beckhams. <laughs> I know you're like oh, you're God. like having our very own David. If there are some people I would not want to be, it's them. The Fuji Cast. By the way, um, <laughs> I noticed it starting to happen just a moment ago. You might have heard. Can you hear this noise in the background? Yeah. Sorry. That's not your tummy, is it? <laughs> it's not your vegan tummy. We've uh, the the guy next door. Uh, once a week, he uh, he mows his. Well, the guy doesn't mow his lawn. Actually, he gets somebody in to do it, and uh, the guys will arrive to mow the lawn. So for the first for the first ten fifteen minutes, because we have to make a shift on with this, you're just going to hear a, a lawn being mowed in the background. Can we live with that? Yeah. Yeah. Just about. Yeah. Go with us on this one. Anyway, coming up today, you and your questions. The mailbag is electronically brimming. So thank you for your questions, thoughts, and feedback that you've been sending in to click at food fujicast.co.uk if you've emailed before fantastic there we are there's a bit of German for you yeah <laughs> you're officially what we know as a friend of the show if you've never emailed before get on that keyboard and announce yourself as a first time writer for those who have Fujifilm cameras brand ambassador Kevin will answer those more tech questions <laughs> <laughs> questions and other thoughts of photographers pro and otherwise who use all the other flavours and makes across all genres you're welcome to send us your stories as well we haven't had enough stories of late have we no stories are good tell stories us stories good. story it doesn't have to start with in the beginning <laughs> during the war mm -hmm. no but it's nice to know your stories because that's the way people learn you know from genres and yeah absolutely like yeah uh, we're going to visit the coat of ego a lost island off the coast of italy where we read out some of your lovely reviews for Sassanti Secondi, which is 60 seconds in Italian, by the way. So if you've left a, a, a review on Apple Podcasts, thank you. Books, they're back, as you know from last week. Um, we will have a recommended book. And uh, before we go on, remember to join the, the private Fujicast group. It's a very safe place. We don't get ridiculed for asking even the most simple questions. That's very important. Facebook, by yeah, the way. Uh, yeah. What did I say? You just said group. Oh, Facebook group. Yes. Right. Group. I, I, Facebook group. Facebook group. Facebook Sorry. group. <laughs> you need a jingle. Facebook. Oh, has he stopped? He stopped mowing. Uh, I was getting used to that. It was quite he cathartic had... having that in the background. No, he stopped mowing. No, mowing. <laughs> You're terrible. <laughs>
<laughs> I wish I could walk around with a jingle player. Can you imagine that? Whenever you're somewhere. Well, sadly, I can imagine it. Yeah. <laughs> you could just press something and a jingle would come up. You'd be like one of those uh, the Buddhist monks in town in London walking around all day long. Instead of having bells and a happy smile, you'd have a little a jingle, digital... Have a jingle player. Walking past people pressing oh, buttons. Oh, dear. Yeah. This week's guest on the show, by the way, is Jeff Carter, founder of McLean Photographic. We like to think, we listen. You said... What about finding some photographers who train their cameras on sport? So, yeah, we found one. And you also said, how about a little bit more on landscape photography? And so, we found one. It's a great start because Jeff covers both bases. Uh, his motorsport work in particular is much lauded in the world of things that move quickly on four wheels. And though we always say with our guests that it's not a prerequisite, uh, this is a recognised, respected motorsport pro photographer who shoots using, guess what, Fujifilm gear. So, if this were a checkbox ticking exercise, three in a row. Uh, and because we're into that listening mode, I got a message from Jamie Pecton here, who said, uh, Enjoyed the Christmas special, lads, and despite being 2020 now, I've gone back and listened a few times over. I love the outtakes at the end. It's a real glimpse into how the show is done. Any chance you could intro that as a more regular feature? So, uh, the answer is yes. Um, where there are outtakes, of course. We'll, we'll do them right at the end, though, after the closing theme. So there's a ris reason to, to listen right to the fading embers. So uh, let's get to your questions. Kev, baton past. Uh, do you have the first? I shall go first. I have a question from our good friend, Murray McMillan. Murray. Murray. He says, hey, you pair. How the hell are you both? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're very fine, thank you. He's from Scotland, so there's nothing like that. But but well, he but, wouldn't have sounded like that. No, no. Um, I'm not even going to try it. No. He then goes on to say, blah blah, rhubarb, rhubarb. <laughs> uh, I want to ask, with the X Pro Three now out and all the stuff that's went with it, yeah. hype, positive comments, negative comments, the screen, etc., etc., etc. I'd considered buying one. I have the XT3 for weddings. I also have the GFX 50R for everything else, and need a second body for weddings alongside the XT3. My first Fuji was the X Pro Two, which I loved but have since sold on anyway i also had twice and sold twice the x100f <laughs> god fujifilm no wonder fujifilm uk love you murray <laughs> they do right yeah, i love the form factor of it the camera itself was absolutely beautiful but i didn't like the lens shooting at f2 a lot i felt that the issue was with the lens being soft at f2 eventually got to me even though even if it actually wasn't that much of a hassle yeah. sorry i'm rambling he puts that in brackets i'm not saying that even though it's true anyway i have a feeling that the next x100 something or other he says will be a camera that i will very much be interested in. I've heard rumours of a new lens, dual card slots, maybe a flip screen. I know Kevin and so many others love the X100 series. Yeah. What would you guys like to see in the camera if and when it comes? I have a feeling we might see it in early 2020 and Kevin probably knows already. Kevin does not know yeah, already. Yeah, we might do. I certainly uh, do not. I have n zero things to do with the X100 so I have no idea. Um, what, so what would you like to see in an X1? Because you have an X100. Yeah, F. I do. So what would you like to see? Uh, in, an, in one, well, I, so I, I'm hoping for the other camera. Look, the man started. Yeah, he, uh, he's, he's put it back on again. The man started mowing again. <laughs> um, I, um, You've got to wear out that cow button. <laughs> you want the, the 100, don't you, really? Not the other camera that I'm hoping for. In a, well, you know, I'm pretty happy with, with the 100 as it is. I, I'm not sure I need to see an awful lot more for, for that. Mm. I, it's not a camera that I, I feel necessarily... What could they do to it? I mean, I suppose... I suppose a few more video features would be nice within that, um, because it's uh, mm -hmm. it's a little bit lacking in 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 video. But then you have got the XT series for that. I mean, well, you, you yeah. load them all up with everything. What's the no, point of having different cameras uh, doing different things? Yeah, exactly. And also, if you want a small form factor camera like mm. the X100, uh, you know, you've got the XT100, mm. which is uh, you know got kind of um, video and flip screens and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, I, I would say yes, the lens is the thing that is the the most obvious thing to to update. Um, my understand well, my, my know for a fact that the lens in the X100F is the same lens that was in the original Finepix X100 some yeah. eight, ten years ago, whatever it was now, six, eight years ago. So um, that lens will have been will be rendering against a or resolving against the twelve, the original twelve megapixel sensor. So yes, if if they do replace the lens, I guess that would be something that that is an obvious thing. Personally, I wouldn't want a flip screen in the X100 next. No. Um, although I, I never wanted one in the X Pro Three and. You 
you know, I, I am on the minority for sure. The on, the only flip screen I, screen I'm interested in is one that flips properly round and does all the yeah. articulation. I yeah. can't see the point of making these these really sort of fairly um, in between these screens. Yeah, they're, and they're, when they come up, you're always afraid you're going to break them off. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, I I, I don't know honestly. I. I occasionally they ask us things like you know what would you like to see in the next x100 and i'm like you know what i don't know because it's so good it is it's really really nice as it is dual card slots Mm, it's going to make it bigger Mm. i don't think uh, x100 f uh, is not a camera i mean i do use it at weddings but i don't use it exclusively at weddings um uh, you know i think if you start putting dual card slots in there then are you going to use it? Yeah, probably would use it more, but we're at the expense of size, probably not. Um, what else did he mention? Uh, flip screen. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the the X100F, um, presumably the next version of that will take on board the new X-Trans, I think it's 4 now, right? Mm-hmm. Sensor, um, which will be Ace, um, and that, that will inherit the, the video now, features, now, I would have thought. if it was an XT we were talking about, then, yeah, I have a list of stuff I'd like. Um, well, we're not. We're, we're talking about X100. Oh, are, are, are we allowed to talk about an XT? How about yeah. new? Oh, okay. All right. Let's move on then. Kevin Neal, I've started a 365 project, which I plan to show as an exhibition at the end of the year. Well, that's a great idea, isn't it? Um, yeah. Although this year, of course, it's going to be 366. Don't miss a day. Is it? Is we're it, a leap year. Is it a leap year? Yeah. Oh, that's uh, exciting, isn't officially, it? Officially. Um, so February yeah. gets 29 days. Mm-hmm. It does. Ooh. And also, did you know the bank holiday, the May bank holiday is on Friday this year instead of Monday? Is that right? Yeah. How strange. Something to do with... Somebody getting something wrong. The Queen. The Queen. Right. Or, no, something to do with the war. During the war? Something to do with something. It might be 50 right. years of the end of the war or something. Oh, I see. Uh, so, oh, well, that makes sense. Bank holiday is on, yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's Friday the 8th of May instead of okay. Friday the, instead of Monday the, no, Monday the, uh, well, you better check that. <laughs> Look don't, it up. Don't all change your holidays based on my, my inaccuracies, <laughs> by the way. Kevin said we were supposed to have the day off. <laughs> yeah, don't all not go to work. <clears throat> yeah, anyway. Christopher Kremen continues. I'm trying to do a picture a day of just something not necessarily groundbreaking, but something that makes me smile. On that note, are you familiar with one of the longest-running 365 projects called The Daily Nice by a photographer called Jason Evans? Have you ever heard of The Daily Nice? No, but it seems nice. Just daily pictures of, of one thing that makes them smile. It changes every day. If you could do a 365, what would it be about? I don't know. I mean, it just... I would. Ima- you couldn't have a theme to it, surely. Not every single day. Yeah, it might be difficult, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know. I've, I tell you what I have seen that I've, I've found absolutely fascinating. I've seen a few of them now, is people who have taken a picture of their child every day yeah, or every yeah, week for a yeah. period of time. One of them I saw... That, uh, when I see them, I think, oh, why did I not think of Absolutely, that? yeah, but, I mean, it must be a brutally hard thing to do. This one I saw was from zero, mm. day one, mm. to the to her 21st birthday. Uh, and oh, he, he yeah. says every single day. So yeah. on the days that they weren't together, she took her, her own photo yeah. and sent it to him. Uh, and it's incredible. Obviously, it's very fast stop motion, but it's absolutely incredible. Absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, there was so the, the the an Asian father and his son that did a beautiful one um, together, um, always hugging in the same position. I thought that was. Oh a my one. god! I uh, would cry my eyes out oh, if I saw that. No, that was one of the. I think I, I must have seen on the BBC website uh, last year at some stage. But it was an absolutely wonderful project. I thought that was absolutely beautiful. So. Uh, so I, I don't know. And the, I've I've done three six fives, but in a kind of cheats way, in that I've been it's been a retrospective of the work I've done over the last couple of years. Just, just have you, for the have sake you ever of done a? Th- is well, it, I've never done a proper um, three six five. Can't be called three six five. No, it can't be, can it? Well, it was, but it shouldn't have been. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I would find that really hard. And, and kudos to the people who do yeah. do that. I couldn't do it with a theme for sure. It uh, might uh, it might be. I mean, if I if I was to force myself to do it with a theme, I think I'd have to base it on a time. So I would say right at eight o'clock every morning. No, that's not good because. Perhaps I wouldn't be up every day. Well, you so, might be on the loo, and uh, who wants a picture like that? Well, doesn't matter, does it? If you're doing it properly, documentary and all that, straight ahead, not yeah. straight down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, for that's an idea. Yeah. Uh, what, Kev on the what, loo? Whatever. <laughs> no, whatever. Whatever you're looking at at yeah. four p.m. Yes. Um, every day could be your three six five. Wow. So that, what? Now that is a good idea. That is a good yeah. idea, isn't it? Yeah. I've just had a good idea. Hey, let's all yeah. do it. Everybody on the Fujikasu who's listening wants to do this from the, the, the first four, of the February. Four, the four p.m. picture. 
picture? Yeah, 4 p.m. 4 p.m. You take a picture. Doesn't matter what camera. Okay. Use your phone. Whatever. 4 p.m. Take a picture <laughs> of whatever you are staring at. All right. Before this goes absolutely mad in the Facebook group, and we end up with a hundred separate posts. Oh yeah. Let's set a rule about this. The first person that gets the 4 p.m. picture up, that's the one everybody has to then join in underneath. Yeah, we need to think about this. I've, yeah. I've unleashed another one. Because I can imagine Peter Kasbergen, who is, is <laughs> one of our most cherished moderators, might pull out his hair if, if, he, if he just sees one, one picture a mm. um, hundred <laughs> times or something. He would explode. <laughs> he would literally, he would just go bang. So I think it's a good idea in the Facebook group. Yeah. I think it might be nice well, in the Flickr group that we've, we've, we've sort of, there's an unofficial Flickr group that's grown up. But let's put it in the Facebook oh, group. Oh, yeah, Flickr. But it has to go um, 4 p.m., on on the first the first person that posts, okay, then it has to go after that post. Any that pop up after that will be deleted. Oh, I know that sounds horrible, brutal, brutal. brutal. I know, but we've got to go with the rules. But also, don't forget, keep them for yourself and <clears> make your own blog posts and Instagram it or whatever. You know, um, if you want to Instagram it and hashtag us, the hashtag is um, very, very, being very carefully thought out. It's hashtag FujiCast. Took us ages to think of that. Four at FujiCast. Four. Oh, it's almost it's almost alliterates, it. doesn't it? it? Four at Fujicast. Fujicast at four. No, four Fujicast at four. Four. <laughs> we need to we need to decide. Yeah, go I for it. You decide. I t- well, no, you make a decision. I always think of the jingle names. <laughs> okay, four at Fujicast. The number four A T Fujicast. Yes, hashtag like it. four at Fujicast, and we will we will try. Is and- that the numerical four? Yes, F O U R. That's why I said the number four. Right. Okay. Uh, four at Fujicast. Oh, did you? I'm, I'm um, we we will try and um, in in our brief moments of um, sanity try and <laughs> try and uh, organize that. I think that's a great idea though. Yeah, and and also like if you want to edit it and you know absolutely. Make Make it, you know, if it's if it, it doesn't matter. But four o'clock every single day at four o'clock, and what we will do the first thing you see. This is it. I'm gonna. I'm stealing this off um, Uncle Albert. What we're gonna do during the war. During the war, <laughs> Matt Howe, um, What we're gonna do the person who manages it yes. the most in yeah. the three six three hundred sixty five days. That's after, Matt's idea. You I can't know. steal that. Yeah, I can. All right. He won't mind. Um, I he whoever's the closest. So if you get three hundred sixty five posts up, right. then you will be the winner. Uh, and but it has it, to be February to February, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> February to February, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, if you only get four hundred and no, not four hundred, three hundred and well, it's going to be three six six, isn't it? No, it's well, not. No, it will be three six five by then. Okay, so if you get, th- I'm really excited by this. Can you tell? I can tell. Three six four, <laughs> three six two, three six one. You might not quite get close, and the winner will get a. Oh, um, here we go. Something we'll think of something really special. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we get a new sounds like money to me. Yeah, four at Foodcast. That's great. Yeah, that's brilliant. That, that all came so, out that Christopher a, Krebman's mail. This is going to be an exhibition. This is why your mails are so so precious. It's going to be a book. Yes, uh, it's going to be a t-shirt. We, we might win an OBE for this. <laughs> I don't know about that. Four go. at Foodcast has to be four o'clock. Time stamp your pictures. Right. No taking a picture at two minutes past four and pretending. No. Um, I don't know how that's uh, going to technically work out with, a, with... Well, I got in there first. He wasn't there first, or she wasn't there first. I was there first. No, I tell you what we'll how do. We, how are we going to do this? I'll organise it on the Facebook. I'll, I'll create an album or something. Right. Yeah, we'll sort right, that out. Right. Um, but it needs to be a daily one, because we want to see it every day. Yeah. All right, I'll let you do, deal with the... Because the, you're better at Maybe Peter... Like well, I think Peter should organise this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Pete. Just... just drawn you in there um your turn for a question i think okay so i have one from uh neil swanson yep he says hello kevin and neil i was wondering if kevin had any chance to try capture one might possibly need to be the very 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 latest version of fuji uh, fuji specific capture one mm-hmm. but to see if when he opened a raw file the jpeg settings were applied now we've had Ooh. this question Ooh. a few times yeah we have um it's always worth mentioning this one again though yeah uh, because capture one is becoming much more popular in the community so he goes on to say that he's used um various different things exposure and all that kind of stuff but capture one so the answer and this is a definitive answer is that when you take a capture one basically treats your fujifilm files similarly to um uh, lightroom in mm-hmm. that when you take a, a photo in your camera and, and you're shooting raw but you have it set to let's just say across black and white mm-hmm. okay now if you have it set to across black and white with plus two shadows and plus two highlights when you take that raw file into lightroom it just becomes color and ignores everything you can apply the across preset in in lightroom when you take that raw file into Capture One, it will apply the across black and white setting, whatever they call it in, in um, Capture One. It will not apply the shadows and highlights. 
Okay, oh. so it does not take Capture One does not take the in-camera editing effects, if you like, but it will go one step ahead of um, Lightroom and apply the black and white preset in the first place, which you can then just back out of if you want to go back to RAW. Um, so it, it's it's a, it's a little bit quicker in that way. Uh, but to answer your original question, I do have um, Capture One version twenty or whatever they call it now. Um, it always makes cracks me up the name that thing. capture one well, uh, phase one capture one version mm. 20 mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh so i do have it i do not use it really i have to say i still use lightroom for Lightroom, my wedding editing. Okay. um i will possibly try and give it a bit more of a, yeah. uh, of a go this year so yep yeah, that's that's my understanding so uh thank you neil okay uh one more then it's time for the interview um from the vegan desk <laughs> Matt Greenwood. This is not so much a question, but just... Um, um, and we're like these, by the way. Sometimes when you, when you pull us up on stuff or you mention things, it's quite nice. Um, heard Kevin mention in episode 48 that not eating dairy or meat for a year was an equivalent reduction in carbon emissions as not driving a car for a year. Thought it was important to point out that all the emissions from meat and dairy animals come from the carbon cycle already, so the net emissions are pretty much zero whereas cars use fossil fuels, which release carbon that was previously trapped underground. I read this to my wife last night, actually, and I said, I'm trying to get my head around this, and she explained it. It made more sense when I yeah. had had a glass or three of red. Yeah, I mean, yeah, absolutely, of course he's right. But the article I was reading was not about the natural um, emissions. It was about the emissions used in transporting animals. All right. Um, and the, the fuel used on planes to transport their food and all that kind of stuff. So it does, well, so I've read. <laughs> well, right he, well, here's something I didn't know. Yeah. Arguably a more important fact, says uh, Matt, is that the top 15 container ships that chug around our seas produce more emissions than every car in the world combined. Yeah, Do you know I, that? That's I, amazing. I didn't know, but I can wow. well believe it. Those things are absolutely <clears throat> huge. But, you know, at the end of the day... It gets dark. Mu- <laughs> <laughs> at the end of the day, money talks, doesn't it? The, you it know, does. big, massive businesses don't give a... F- don't be rude. ...about yeah. us, people, generally, and the economy and the environment and everything. Rich, richer, poor, poorer. That's life. Oh, God, yeah. Sorry about that, but... Another day closer to being dead. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Oh, <laughs> how long have you been waiting to throw that at me? Well, <laughs> my hand is always hovering over the number 14 button, which is that one. Uh, right, OK, um, time for this week's interview. <laughs> Jeff Carter is our guest this week, sport photographer, motorsport photographer, owner of McLean Photographic, in charge, as you'll find out, of organising photographers on the circuit and keeping them out of harm's way. Uh, a darn fine landscape photographer, one of Fujifilm's X series official photographers, and he's a workshop mentor too. Sign me up, Scotty, which is a, a cheeky yet tenuous link to a, the beautiful place he chooses to live in the world too, as you'll, you'll find out. So, Jeff, life started in the Air Force for you, and I, I think that's where the photography started, wasn't it? I mean, you, you were a pro in 94, but you left the Air Force two years later. So I'm wondering what was well, happening in those two years. Yeah. Well, actually, I was an engineer in the Royal Air Force. I worked on Tornado and Nimrod flight simulators. Oh, Motorsport wow. and photography was a bit of a hobby of mine. Um, and in 1993, the... Uh, powers that be decided that we were ripe for redundancy the whole trade because there's about 500 of us in the royal air force working on flight simulators uh the royal navy the american air force all use civilians they didn't use uh, uh use their own personnel so we were ripe for uh, redundancy so i decided in 1993 what did i really want to do and i decided i wanted to work as a photographer so i ramped it all up the air force were very kind to send me on courses allowed me time off to do stuff um paid for courses which was great um and it gave me three years before i officially left in 1996 so that's why i started in 94 oh. but actually didn't leave the air force in 96 because i was sort of uh, balancing the two things but the the, the air force were very very good to me you know i did 14 years and i really enjoyed my time in the military so in those years those those formative years you were working with film and i'm I'm wondering what your thoughts would be about entering a business then with film and now with digital yeah it's funny enough actually we had we had a discussion in bahrain just before christmas at one of the events i was working at but we were talking about film and it's amazing how many photographers that now work in the industries that i work now that have never shot film the good thing about film was it actually gave you a respect for um keeping well money for a start because every time you press the shutter release it costs you money because you had to develop you had to buy the film and develop the film also the time scales were a lot longer in those days obviously you had to develop the film you I remember 
diving into a dark room after a race and sort of developing film there and then, you know, and uh, getting stuff out. Same with the newspaper I used to work for. We used to develop and print our own black and whites for the paper. Um, It was all a lot longer processes, whereas now we've all got laptops, we've got a SD card or a a CF card, we just shove in the computer, download them, put them in Photoshop and flick them out within five minutes. You know, it's very, very different. But it does give you a much greater respect. Working with film gave you a much greater respect. The latitude on the transparencies that I was working with, I used to shoot Provia and Velvia a lot, but you didn't have the latitude you have with the digital files. You know, you had to be very precise with your exposures. You had to be very, very constant and also be very mindful you've only got 36 shots so if you're running a camera eight frames a second like i was shooting nikon f5s at the time you had to think that's only three four seconds before the film runs out if you Mm. keep your finger on the button do you still work with a film mentality or or has that gone as mirrorless as has has gifted you the the opportunity to see what you're shooting it is it is easy to shoot thousands of shots what i what i say to people when people ask me about this is where it used to cost money every time you press the shutter release now it's time because if you shoot two thousand shots you've got to go through those two thousand shots and find the ones that you want so you still have i still work in a, a mentality that i don't want to take too many shots so i make sure i get what i need but I'm, I I have my camera set to 11 frames a second when I'm working track side on the motorsport, for example, or when I'm working uh, on the pitch side at rugby. But I, I I shoot in two, three second bursts, but I can always, if something happens, I can put my finger on and let, let it run. But you have to have that mentality of thinking... I don't want to spend hours at my computer. Well, I haven't got the time to spend hours at my computer after the, after whatever I've been shooting to go through everything. Mm. So you tend, I still tend to shoot with that mentality about things. And also I try and get as much right in the camera as possible. I, I'm intrigued as to, when I mean, you said it was a passion anyway, wasn't it? So that, that must be the obvious reason why sport became the, the if you like the focus of, of your company the moment you left the RAF that but, but you didn't move into portraits or weddings or anything it was sport well I did do weddings and portraits I think when you when you first start off you've got to try and I I was I'm not being big headed I was I got pretty good at it, but I wasn't passionate about it I've been very lucky that I've been able to go a direction that I am actually got a lot of passion for um, what happened in, well, while I was in the Royal Air Force I was treasurer of the RAF Cottesmore Karting Club. Um, we went to races, etc. So I never raced. I was a mechanic on one of the carts and things like that. So um, I had a passion for it beforehand, and it was a right way to go. It is very, very difficult to get into a, a into motorsport as a photographer. It's even worse now. So I had to spread the loads. Hence, why I did the portraits. And I said I worked as a star photographer for a local paper as well. Oh, yeah. Which, luckily enough, I worked the weekends for them. So I was able to do the football, the cricket, and all the other sports that the locals were playing so again it gave me a good grounding in a lot of different sports but it was always the motorsport that where the passion was and given all the sport that you have been photographing because i know you'd work with the british canoe slalom team and, and and you mentioned the newspaper work as well your your passion really was working with cars and noise and it, it, what is what is it about motorsport that draws photographers to that? Do you think? I, th- I think you've just said it. It's, it is. It's one of the few sports that actually motorsport is very frustrating as well as very um, iconic because you have most sports you see the person where. Well, Canoe slalom, you've just mentioned it. I was the official photographer in 95, 96 for the British Canoe Slalom. It wasn't a paying role. It was just something that a friend of myself and another photographer did, and we got a lot of experience out of it. When you take pictures of um, canoeist paddlers, you see their faces. You see the passion and you can see the grit and determinations. Racing drivers are inside, usually inside a cockpit, and they've got a helmet on. You can't see them. So it's a very difficult sport to photograph from that point of view, from the personal point of view. But it's all about the, the smell, the speed, the thing. That's something you have to try and get across in a photograph. If you've got a car doing 200 miles an hour down the Mulsan Strait at Le Mans, and you take that shot at 8,000 a second, it looks like it's parked on the track. So. Yeah. To show that speed is also, in a, in a still image, you have to sort of know what you're doing. So, again, I try, as I think, to tell a story. As a newspaper photographer, I have to tell a story with an image, and that's something I've got very passionate about, and it can be slightly difficult with motorsport because you can't see the people in the cars, so you try and tell the story a different way. I've heard it said that racing drivers can be, can be quite awkward characters. They're not always yeah. the, most, um, the, the most easy to work with. Well, it depends what level 
level you work at. Um, Formula One has got a bad reputation for it because obviously being the top of the tree, et cetera, et cetera. Now I've worked with some quite famous names in the past. I'm not going to drop names, but I will say that drivers I've had drivers of both types. I've had the ones that um, are really awkward to work with and don't want to do the PR stuff. And they got the other guys who are quite happy to do whatever you want. Once they reach a certain level, they then tend to calm down, but they are very protective about their image, et cetera, et cetera. For, I'll give you an example. Um, I was Nigel Mansell's press officer when he did Le Mans in 2010. Um, I've worked with Nigel on no, no many occasions going back to 2001. And he can be the most awkward bugger in the world, but he can also be be the nicest person in the world it just depends at what day you catch him on whereas another guy called johnny herbert you probably heard of yes yeah johnny is fantastic to work with any day of the week johnny is a cheeky chappy and he loves and he and long as you don't take the mickey he will do whatever you want and actually jeff on the flip side i mean you mentioned being in charge of pr and a media delegate i mean do you have the responsibility to organize the photographers on the press because that's a role you've you've held as well i would imagine looking after image hungry photographers can be a, a tricky balancing wow. act as well can't it well, that's a good thing about being a photographer. You know, my, my role now for the FIA, the Federation International Automobile, the world governing body, I've been yeah. working for them for 10 years now as a media delegate. Now, what that means is I'm in charge of all the media at certain events. Now, I work on the World Endurance Championship, Le Mans 24 being one of them. I have upwards of 500 photographers at Le Mans. Now, I have to do a safety briefing. We take safety very, very seriously, whether it be drivers, spectators, or photographers. Now, photographers are working tracks they have to understand the, the dangers there are it's highly dangerous it's not easy we do have some photographers who think when they put this photo vest on it's made of kevlar and they're superman and it's mm. gonna it's gonna bounce off mm. them the car's gonna bounce off them if they get hit because they have to come and see me before they, we have safety briefings they have to come and sit in front of me before they go out and they know i'm a photographer they tend to take what i'm telling them seriously because i've done the job right. i've I go out there, I take photographs, I've done the job. So I'm. it's not just some PR person telling them what to do. It's a photographer telling them what to do. I've always thought, in particular with rally work, where the cars are skirting the very edges of carved out tracks, it, it can be particularly dangerous work, can't it? Rallying is very difficult. I do the European Historic Rally Championship for the, the FIA as well. Um, and I've seen guys standing in really stupid places and you just think, why are you standing there? Mm. You are absolutely stupid. And it could be spectators. You know, spectators, we've had the we probably Jim Clark rally a few years ago, which would have been, what, five years ago, six years ago now, where three spectators were killed. And it's really hurts the Jim Clark rally hasn't run for a few years because mm. of the and, – and there's so many safety rules now put in place for spectators because of that. So it has a knock-on effect as well. But, you know, tragically, three people lost their lives because they were standing in the wrong place. Well, let's talk about the endurance as well because we mentioned 24-hour Le Mans. I mean, that's an endurance thing for the drivers, an endur endurance thing for your team too, I would have thought. Well, the 24 hours Le Mans is very unique. It's a special event. It's Well, National Geographic named it in 2013 as the most prestigious sporting event in the world ahead of the olympics and the super bowl and the Ryder cup etc so it's got that level of you know people go to le mans they might not be might not even be race fans but they they go to le mans for the spectacle and the ambience and the you know it's a fantastic event but as you say it's 24 hours but it's not 24 hours it's actually 10 days so you've got 10 days of build up to it and the race itself i work from eight o'clock saturday morning right the way through till midnight on sunday and i have probably have two hours sleep you oh. are definitely running on adrenaline yeah. so i have a camp bed in my office so i i actually sleep at the circuit some people go back they have camper vans on on site or they go back to the hotel but i can't leave because of my role as the media delegate i can't leave so i i but i can only sleep for a couple of hours and i have to be back out and doing stuff so it is an it is an amazing event but i tell you what monday i am absolutely <laughs> shattered <laughs> and everybody you. else is too what makes a good sport sports photographer and maybe we we should center upon the motorsports with this because you were talking about shutter speed and how important that can, that can be it also seems to me that angles and unique composition have a, a strong part to play because you're trying to separate yourself from the crowd i said this to a person i had this i do get a lot of people come to me and say i want to be a motorsport photographer and they send me a selection of their images and normally it's a, a set of images of a car 
coming around a corner. Now, I'm not being funny, but it's nothing. This it's, They were lovely shots, don't get me wrong, well exposed. You know, the, the car might have one wheel off the ground. They could be really nice action shots, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I, I take those sorts of shots too. But you've got to tell a story. As I said earlier, You, you the, the difficulty with motorsport especially is you can't see the drivers. So I tend to spend a lot of my time in the pit lane. That's where you see the mechanics working. We And each of our cars have three drivers at Le Mans. So you have the other two drivers in the pit box. You've got the team manager. You've got the mechanics, the engineers working, looking at screens, working on the car. If the car comes in with a problem, they're in. The, they're, they're working really hard. So that's where you can get your personal shots. You can get your, you know, gritty determination shots. You can get the elation when they win. You can get the despondency when they lose. You know, or the car's broken or whatever. So that's where you get your emotional shots. But you've got to tell a story. I also don't ignore the fans because the fans. You've got two hundred and fifty thousand fans at, at yeah. Le Mans, um, all having a great time. You know, drinking. Thinking, you know, w- waving their flags, whichever team they're supporting. So that's what, if I was, if somebody wants to work for me in my role as a media delegate, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a passion. I'm looking for excitement. I'm looking for images that tell a story. It's more than the car. More than the car. The cars are important. And, you know, we go out and we will think, but we tend to go and shoot the the standard. What we do, how I work is on the free practice sessions on thir- on Wednesday and Thursday we have free practice and qualifying those are the days that I go out and get a shot of every car from two or three different corners now it could be at night we have running shots so if I need a shot for a web story if I'm writing a story you know I do the race reports or I do a web story I can then put up I have a picture bank a banked image if you like of that car on a corner so i've got that shot so fujifilm jeff not necessarily the first camera system that's recommended for sports work in 2012 i bought an x100 like most of the professional photographers when the little x100 came out in 2012 2011 2012 i bought one i had a black special edition one limited edition one it was a fantastic camera i used to have um, a fuji ga ga645 medium format fixed lens camera and I love that camera. This is the X100 was like a small version of that. You know, it wasn't medium format, but it was a small version. Fitting in my pocket, fantastic lens on it, could go anywhere there. Let, um, leave shutter. It was just superb. And then X Pro One came out. I bought one to run alongside for my own personal work, alongside my Nikons. And then the XT1 came out. I thought, you know what? I'm going to buy one of these and I'm going to sell my Nikon gear. And I'll, I'll tell you what, it took me three months to make that decision because I was mm. angst in about the whole thing. Yeah. And it was a difficult um, thing. But what my role in 2015, I was asked to become an ex-photographer. And I've been working with Fujifilm since then to help develop the camera systems. And now with the X-T3, the 200mm f2 we've now got, which is a stunning lens. I sat in a meeting in 2015 in Tokyo because we go to Japan once a year with the WC. And I go to meet with the guys from Fujifilm while I'm there. And I turn around with myself and three other ex-photographers sat in this meeting. We all said, we need a fast telephoto prime lens for the 100-400s, a really good lens, but it's not fast enough. We need a fast telephoto to prime and it took three years but what they've come up with is a fantastic lens and i'm really proud to have you know be able to help fujifilm develop that system for what i need it for now we're at a stage where the xt3 is a great camera is it as quick as a canon 1dx mark two three whatever we're on now or a 5d mark four or a, a nikon d5 are we on an s yet but you know no, d5s no. Probably not, not you know, but no. I don't care because can I do my job with it? Yes. Will it follow focus a car at 200 mile an hour? Yes. Can I shoot rugby with it? Yes. I can do all that and I can get images and my clients don't give a monkey's while I took it on. As long as I got the, as long as I got the pictures and it's to the quality they, they want, everyone's happy. Why do you think then that, I mean, I, I go to stadium and I look around. I'm always looking, well, where's the Fuji glass? Yeah. And, and yeah. I'm still seeing, you know, the telltale white Canon zooms. Yeah. Well, what, and you know why? Do you think I'll be- tell you why. Go on then. Because we're a conservative bunch. Oh, okay. You're, we're, uh, photographers, we buy into it. You, you invest a lot of money into things. One thing I must say before we go any further, all the Fujifilm gear I've got in my camera bag is paid for by me. I don't get given any stuff. I get a nice discount, but I don't get given stuff. I wouldn't do it if I got given stuff because how can I, as a photographer, tell somebody else, this is what I use and this is what I use it for, and it's great if I'm being given it. It's, it's it, my, it, it doesn't work. So... But so I've invested a lot of money and time into Fujifilm. So and I know it works for me. It doesn't work for everybody, but it works for me. 
I've had guys who have borrowed the, the Fujifilm and, and gone, wow, this is so much lighter. Mm. I can get really good images with it. Fantastic. But I'm not going to change because I've invested so much in the, <laughs> you know, in the Canon gear. It's like, why do we all drive different cars? We drive cars that suit our abilities. Not every car suits every driver, but we all don't. And it's the same with camera systems. Cameras work for certain people in a certain way. I was lucky at Le Mans. Sony were there at Le Mans this year, and I borrowed an A9 and a 400 f2.8. And it was, and I ran it alongside my T3 and my 200 mil with my 1.4 converter on it. And I was getting images off both, similar images off both. And to be honest, I couldn't tell that much of a difference. It was a little bit better off the fall off because obviously being full frame, the backgrounds were slightly more out of focus on the sony's but it was negligible with the yeah. type of stuff that i was shooting the difference is the sony sony gear was 14 grand and my my gear was seven grand wow i mean it's half the price yeah. so as a working photographer you've also got to take that into consideration because when you're buying your own gear and you've got to insure it is is the sony better than the fujifilm mm, depends what you want but full frame sometimes full full frame will work out better than crop but crop has its advantages as well however is it double the is it twice as good no way now you no way. you film as well don't you and the xt1 yeah. you started filming with straight away um uh, and, 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 and there are many that use the Sony system, of course, for, for film work. But you're, you're sticking with the X-T3 uh, unit for that as well, aren't you? The T3 is a brilliant, absolutely stunning camera for, for video work. And I know a lot of video guys are actually using T3s now. 4K, 60K, six, 60 frames a second. You know, it is a brilliant, they're brilliant cameras. Yeah, absolutely. But again, yeah. I've kept the H, the XH1 because of its in body stabilization, which obviously the T3 doesn't have the in body stabilization for handheld stuff. But I've invested in things like the um, Ronin S gimbals, gimbals TGI yeah. brought out. So I've got gimbals to, to help me with that side of things. So when I'm filming, the, I use it on the rally cars when I'm shooting the rallies, the historic rallies. That's where I'm doing most of my filming now. And they're fantastic for that, you know, and they're lightweight. I can get everything when I do a lot of flying. I did 87 flights last year, and all my gear, including the 200 mil, goes into a, a Manfrotto 50 backpack, oh, which, is, which, <laughs> which goes in the top locker above my head on the yeah. um, on the planes. There aren't many photographers with strong reputations in one film. We've talked a lot about sport, who forge equal kind of reputation in another. I mean, your landscape work is beautiful, Jeff. Well, I've always been interested in landscape photography because it's my, you know, what the, the industry I work in is full on, you know, you long hours, etc. And when you can disappear into the highlands of Scotland and set up a camera and sit there and watch a sunrise, it sort of becomes the anti-motorsport photography. So mm. it's sort of starting from there. I, I, I suppose landscape photography, even before I turned professional, was always a passion of mine. So um, I've been very lucky that I can sort of, you know, where I live in, I say in, I live in East Lothian, near um, on the east coast of Scotland. Yeah, it's a wonderful part of the world. Yeah. So I love the Highlands. And I love the islands. And you know, I got there. I've got a trip planned next month uh, with a friend of mine. We go every year. You know, it's something we go for two days and just go and lose ourselves. But it's something that I try to pass on to my clients is the passion, the fact that you know you you work. You know, you know, you're, you're working with what you're presented with. You know, looking at the wind at the moment, it's a very grey day, typical Scottish wind today. But I'm sure I could go out there and get something. And it's trying to tell people you don't always have to wait for sunny skies and white fluffy clouds and all the rest of it. You need to get work with what you've got. Why did you choose um, uh, workshops in in landscape work? Because it, I think it's something. I think it's something that I I can give back. You know, I love teaching people i get a lot of people coming to me on my website asking me questions about motorsport you know or about rugby or um landscapes and they asking things i think so it sort of progress from there it's almost like you know it's another way of getting across i do a two hour what i call back to basics so if somebody gets a new camera they want to learn how to use the camera i'll take them down to the harbor here and we will walk around for two hours and i'll show them how to use the camera they want to come out for a day we i have different themes on my workshop it could be long exposure landscapes or it could be woodland exploration because we have some beautiful woodland around here oh black and white if you want to te you teach people how to shoot in black and white which is if you've shot film you know it's a very different process i'm lucky that I can see a color image, color scene, and I can see it in my mind's eye in black and white because I've shot with black and white for most of my professional and even before that career. I know they're landscape based right now. Any plans for for motorsport sport based ones? The problem with motorsport photography, motorsport um, workshops, is mainly the insurance. 
I can't take them trackside. There's just no way. It's just too dangerous, yeah. um, and the, and the, it's the costs are prohibitive because obviously if you've got three or you got to keep uh, keep an eye on people. Um, I'm happy to advise people on how to shoot, etc. And one of the things we talk about on my photographic club talk, talks is how I shoot. I did a thing for Fujifilm a couple of years ago where I is shooting sports as a spectator. And I chose twelve sports and I shot them as I went to those sports as a spectator and I shot them and filmed myself shooting them and explained how I shot them from the spectator side. Because we do get blase on the media side because we do get special access mm. and sometimes it's interesting to see what the, i forget as a fan how difficult some sports can be but if you know your sport and you can get and you know where to go you can get some just as good a shots as the the professionals so i'm gonna ask you a question you've got you've got a yep. choice you can either go to a beautiful part of scotland that you haven't yet photographed that you that you know is is on your list of must do's or you can stand trackside at one of your favorite race events what are you going to choose? Oh, he, what are you going to choose for the weekend? Landscape. 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 I, yeah. didn't, I didn't think you'd say that. <laughs> no, landscape. I'm sorry. It's just one of those things. I just got a, a massive passion for landscape photography and and showing something that some of the people don't see. You know, they don't see. They, people turn up. I see it, um, especially when I'm up on Sky or Isle of Sky or Isle of Mull. You get you see these buses full of tourists and they jump out. And they've only got ten minutes. They take, they jump out with their cameras. Snap. Thank you very much. I think I'll give you an example. I borrowed from Fujifilm the GFX 50s when it first came out, and I was up in Glenfinnan on the viewpoint overlooking the Loch Loch Shiel, and you've got the um, Bonnie Prince Charlie monument, monument to the 1745 rebellion, and it was absolutely chucking it down in rain. And people were coming up, and we came up. <laughs> people were coming up and taking a picture and walking out, and I just sat there watching the clouds, seeing the wind coming across the Loch, and I waited there an hour. And when I my patience was rewarded because the, it suddenly stopped raining and the sun broke through the clouds and hit the Loch. And I just saw it coming. And sometimes you have to be patient. Um, and I was rewarded that day. Some days it could have been, I could have been there for three hours and got a complete bust. You just don't know. But that's the anticipation. That's what I love about landscape photography because a, a, a bit of sunlight like that can just change it completely. Mm. My thanks to Jeff Carter from McLean Photographic and, of course, for Jeff's work and uh, all the links, appropriate links, uh, you can uh, check out the website. All the W's, fujicast.co.uk, and you'll find all the details you need there. Right, back to the questions. Kev. Uh, this isn't so much of a question rather than a comment, and this is from Louise Trainer in Cumbria. Okay. And she says, Cumbria is the capital of quiet. Oh, it is. Is it? Oh, I love Cumbria. She says, thanks for the introduction to Louis Garvan, and I do hope you can get him on the show at some time. I am trying. I am trying. Oh, I there's promise. a challenge. Challenge Kev. His work has been a real inspiration, partly because of the quiet, I feel, when looking at his work. I know that may sound a little strange, but in this age of noise and loud shouting about one's work, someone like Louis yeah. is a real gem of, to find. Uh, and that's so true. He is such a special person. Um, beautiful man. Beautiful photos. Quiet is a good, good, good word. Yeah, we we almost went on a course with him, didn't we? We did. In London, yeah. but it, uh, I've met him. Didn't transpire. Did met it? him many times. He's just such a nice guy. All right, you'll go. Right, as a regular listener, oh, there's another comment. Can we? We can have a couple of comments. Here's a, an idea for a book. We've got the book to come up in a moment, by the way. Um, hi, Kev. As a regular listener of the excellent Fujicast, I noticed that you are, like me, collecting photo books. This might be a good, good opportunity. What we'll do, we'll go straight into our book after this one, OK? I've just got a book called We Muckers, Youth of Belfast. Have you heard of that one? Mm -hmm. yep. By the German photographer Toby Binder. Mm. Um, since you seem to like black and white reportage, I thought you might like it. Send, send me a list here. It's Toby... Uh, hyphen binder b-i-n-d-e-r dot d-e best regards to yourself and neil so there's an idea for a book Ace, and i will of course be adding all of this stuff that we are um mentioning to the show notes on the website yeah so any kind of youtube videos we talk about books and all that kind of stuff if you go to the episode page on the futurecast.co.uk you shall, you shall see some um, stuff. Talking of books, then let's let's have this week's book. What, do you, what, what right. have you got this week? So this week I have bought in a uh, a book of uh, what well, I would call it a little bit different by uh, Joel Merwitz. So Joel Merwitz, many of you will have heard of him. He's a very famous street photographer. Uh, he's you know he's he's, no, he's known as the corner the corner street uh, photographer from New York. Um, you would have seen a lot of his pictures. And he, what you may or may not know, is that he kind of retired to. Um, um, to Italy, I think. Yeah, I'm sure it was Italy. Okay. It's either Italy or the south of France or somewhere like that. I'm pretty sure it was Italy. And what he spends his time doing now is... Uh 
essentially photographing still life and objects. Um, and if you read his uh, his kind of biographical books, it, it talks about how he, uh, his, a friend of his, brought a tarpaulin round to their their new place in um, in Italy, and he thought, oh, I could use that as a backdrop for some stuff. And then he kind of put some cups and pans and things and took these pictures. So he he's, he's the book I've got in front of me is called Morandi's Objects by Joel Merowitz, and and actually it's he's taken inspiration from the artist Morandi, who is very good at painting single objects or collection of objects. Um, the the lights structure and everything is very beautiful and he's he's taken that into into the world of photography and it may not be a book that you're um if you're a joel mailwitz um fan you might you, know, you might pick it up and think hang on this is just cups and pans but actually it's God, it, it's a no, good never just cups and pans is it i mean look it, it, look at the just the shadow work yeah and, it's an incredible I mean, these are like paintings i mean the first thing i've just picked up is a uh, an old plunger they are like paintings yeah. aren't they and uh, you know really really beautiful stuff um, what a beautiful life it must be that you think okay i'm gonna go to uh because uh, some of these items look like you'd have got them in a junk shop or something and thought yeah. that's gonna look great if i put that on my beautifully hand-painted canvas backdrop yeah uh, this makes me want to go and photograph inanimate objects. Uh, me too. I, I even bought a little table. <laughs> Did you? Yeah, that's as far as I got. I bought a little table. These are pure <laughs> art. I can just see these on people's walls. Uh, interestingly, oh, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. every single picture has exactly the same backdrop. There's a little bit of damage to the it wall in change, the background. doesn't change, does it? No. It's exactly no, the same. No. Um, There's a democracy to this. Yeah, uh, democracy is the correct word. It's good. It's a really good book. I love it. Um, just for glancing through and getting a little bit of still life inspiration. Yeah. So that is Joel Mayowitz is... Morandi's objects, which of course I will link to. That is one of the most inspiring still life books I think I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Are you going to link to it? Obviously. I will. Yeah. I will link to it on our Fujicast. Okay, Fuji. Chris Patterson in uh, Glasgow. Um, it's quite a long question, so so bear with it. But I think it's going to create a few good talking points. And as always, if you hear something that you think oh, I'd like to comment upon that in the Facebook group as well, the Fujicast Facebook group, then please do. Dear Neil and Kev, uh, Nick Turpin talked, uh, talking about street photography got me thinking about something that's, uh, that's been bubbling up recently. Is street photography creepy? I've noticed growing criticism of street photography on the photo nerd corners of the internet. <laughs> People often try and shut down any criticism of street photography by highlighting the fact that it, it isn't illegal. Nick Turpin spoke very well on that issue on The Brighton Show. But in society, there are many legal things that we don't do because of a social contract. Not exploiting homeless people is, is one of those. Through a modern lens, Eisenstadt's VJ Kiss Day Kiss photo, you know the one, don't you? Yeah. May be interpreted as, uh, interpreted rather, as, as documentation of a sexual assault. In typically self-effacing style, I agree with this. Sean Tucker says he takes street photos the way he does because he's scared of the confrontation. Um, for me, part of what's interesting about street is thinking about whether it's creepy or not, and if so, why? Where is the line? Is it about whether the subject would have been comfortable being photographed? Would it be okay if that subject was happy with a final image? Does the photographer's attitude or intent matter? That's a very good point. Because I think still some street photographers are kind of like, I'm taking a photo! It's my legal right. Yeah, well, I I'm, I'm, I, I have some very strong opinions on, on all of this, as I've done I mentioned before so quite right there are people out there who go out of their way to be obnoxious yeah. purely so they can just turn around and, and make a YouTube video of them shaking oh, at there's a, one guy a, on YouTube a, that a, drives me mad a little security guard yeah, who's yeah, only yeah. trying to do his yeah. job you know yeah, yeah. so those kind of people can just <laughs> out of the way they're, they're not relevant um, the whole idea it's, it's interesting the Sean Tucker thing because uh, Sean's pictures are beautiful obviously and they're very you know usually a study of light and, and there's usually a subject or something but you can never really identify them and well, he's often taught about how uh, Van Ho really is his inspiration yeah of course Van Ho kind of um, yeah, yeah. demographic type of image that so it, it, it's the, and absolutely those are amazing amazing images however they don't really tell us much about that moment in history the people the person and what they're wearing, what their face is like, what the characters are like, what they're doing on the streets, the stories, the messages, the history. And it's not creepy to want to uh, preserve a little bit of history. There's nothing creepy about it. Absolutely it, it, nothing creepy about street photography. No. What is creepy is the people on social media 
and the way that our environment, our world is going to control everything. Listen, we when you walk out your house in, in London or anywhere, you are on more cameras than you will ever think you are. Yeah, I, yeah. GCHQ will be all over you. You've got the, the traffic police. You've got the random everything. You've got all the CCTV cameras. People in their freaking cars these days have mm-hmm. cameras everywhere. You know, you, you're on camera absolutely everywhere. None of those pieces, none of those pictures, none of those things that they're recording at that point are for historical um, uh, statement making. Mm. They are to protect people, perhaps, and to to spy, perhaps. But ultimately, they're there for a for a reason for somebody else. Now, if none of us, if we were all f- thought we cannot take pictures on the street of people being people, then how the hell are our kids ever going to know what what it's like in the future? Mm. You know, how the hell are they going to know what a uh, the markets are like nowadays? But market has changed massively over the last um you know not not including the the kind of um the terrible incidents terrible that have happened there but yeah. but just over the last 10 years borough market has changed from an active working market to a hipster kind of trendy place to go and go and eat um and that's not a bad thing but if we you know if people are not photographing the people in that place then how will it ever know so it's absolutely not at all creepy and it should never be creepy um well, there, that's are, the there be- are there that's are creepy people of course no, who are no, who yeah. are abusing it yeah but by and large, they're not. Um, but that's the beauty of. Uh, let's take uh, one of your favourites. I know James Revillius. Yeah, and that that uh, document of of village life and the, uh, the southwest of of England. It's mm. beautiful, isn't it? Yeah, Devon. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It wasn't in London, but it's. Uh, yeah, of course. And you know, we 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 talk. <sighs> We talk about books here. Of course, today we picked up one that was of inanimate objects. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you, you pick up a newspaper, you pick up a book, you, you have to have pictures, you have to have candid pictures. Otherwise, the world becomes in, entirely staged mm-hmm. and you, you don't learn anything from staged things. Absolutely. But very good talking point, though, Chris. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your, for your mail. And if you're sending questions in, then click at fujicast.co.uk. Um, it's it's fascinating to to understand your thoughts about photography as well. So send, send, send. We learn as much from you, really, by, by sending in your thoughts about different genres and, and your experiences. Hmm. Should we go to the Coat of Ego? Is it ready for... Let's go, let's for, go. For takeoff time. Brum, brum. Well, not so much brum, brum. Ah, oh, look. The sound of the cocktail shaker. Oh, mine's a Bloody Mary. Don't worry about the Virgin Mary. Isn't that what they call it? <laughs> You're gonna get in trouble. Is, it, for is that. it a Virgin Mary when you when they don't have the when you don't have the, uh, yeah. the gin of vodka or whatever's in it? I'm just I'm talking about drinks, nothing else. Right, um, thank you very much for your uh, your your wonderful um, testimonials and, and reviews that you're leaving. Um, at the end, we'll have an address for you, uh, a website address, which makes it easier to leave reviews on the podcast app that's relevant to the way you listen. Okay, um, so do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. I have uh, Gareth B. Callan, and Gareth B. Callan says, This show is about the warmth and difference of two people. Um, Neil and Kevin, Neil, the ebullient driving energy behind the mic. Ebullient? Ebullient. 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 No, ebullient. Ebullient. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Warning. Warning. We are trying. <laughs> See, we don't get taught things like this in Newport. It's a bullion. It's a, when you have an abullience. A bullion. Yeah. Drive in I energy. had an abullience on my foot once. <laughs> Behind the back. <laughs> and Kevin, the slightly world-weary sage at the side. I'm oh. world-weary. I sound like Frodo. <laughs> uh, it's a wonderful asymmetry. you got feet that, like him. <laughs> it's a wonderful asymmetry that brings authenticity to their friendship and makes the Fujicast a real and non-pretentious discussion of the everyday experience of photographers, be they professional or enthusiast. If you enjoy capturing images, this is for you. More like two old friends down the pub and some s- <laughs> than some self Proclaimed expert telling you how it should be done. Just subscribe; you won't regret it. This is some storyteller seven. Um, I like I like all these uh, these handles. By the way, hmm. one of my favourite podcasts. I've been a photographer for over forty years. See, this is why it's the code of ego. You see, when you're in the code of ego, you're allowed you're allowed to read stuff like this, but only while you're on the coast in the code of ego. Absolutely, it's a made up place. I've been a photographer for over forty years, but still yearn to grow and develop. There are resources available, but. Um, Few as informative, entertaining as empathetic. Empathetic is the Fuji cast. Brilliantly produced, well programmed, makes me feel like I'm sitting at a table having a pint with two colleagues and friends. Well, I tell you what, Storyteller 7, um, I think we'd enjoy your company. I'm a Fuji travel street landscape photographer in Tennessee. Oh, especially, I'd like to go to Tennessee. Oh, yes. 
And I look forward to making a journey to the UK for one of the events. Never mind that. Let's go to Tennessee. Yeah. Go on then, one more. Okay, one more from Chathams. And Chathams. Uh, there, there, there seems to be a theme in these today, th- this week. Uh, it says, uh, these two guys deserve to be considered gurus in different and delightfully <laughs> complimentary sure. ways. I'm not sure about that. Neil is a world-class <laughs> interviewer and producer, and Kevin ties it all down with his down-to-earth insight and subtle takes and quips. I think that's the same as ebullient and... Uh, <laughs> ebullient. The other thing. Ebullient. Oh. You Balls. have a balance. You have a balance. Experience this. Experience in this Frodo podcast feet. is like observing a couple of masters in a casual and effortless flow of state. All right. If you're interested in time travel, turn on one of the episodes and experience sixty plus minutes vanish into the blink of an eye. They're also very active on the online community they've created from the ground up. I can't imagine how tie try, in trying it is to respond to all of the online questions they are tagged into. Yet they do it. We do. Thanks, Kevin and Neil. And yes, the Fonz is from Milwaukee. And for for you three, by the way. Uh, um, Without a, without a shadow of a doubt. You're our favourite listener, and we mean it. Absolutely true. Right. Um, back to questions. We still have the disasters to come, by the way. Some of the disasters coming in now are great. Please send them in. Um, even if you don't think they're that disastrous, let us be the judge of that. Uh, question, questions, questions. Go on then, Kevin. Oh, all right. I have one from Mark Dell. Now, Mark Dell is a photographer, and I photographed his son's wedding. In Did fact, you? you second shot for me. That, oh, was that Mark's? Do you remember at... Um, that place, that pl- <laughs> that barn with the church outside, uh, Oxfordshire. Uh, oh, of course I do. What's that place called? Um, it's a bit of love. That was it. That one. Nice wedding though, wasn't it? It was great. It was. It was like October, but really sunny outside. Yeah. Well, it always is in October now. Yeah. Hi Neil. Good morning, what, guys. What global warming. Really love the podcast. It's my favourite when walking the dog around muddy Buckinghamshire. We're on the same page about Sean Tucker. <laughs> Perhaps on your show, include some details on how to really start the content for YouTube. Oh. So the question there is how to start up on YouTube. Thanks, Mark. Okay. From someone who's got it completely wrong, let me give you... (laughs) You haven't got it completely wrong. Your Uh, videos are amazing. Well, just mine's misguided, okay? Um, Because, um, is misguided the right phrase? No, that's a phrase that was used about me at school. Um, (laughs) I'm sure it's another phrase I'm seeking. But um, mine's a um, a little bit too all over the place. Um, in you know, if you want to be successful on YouTube, I think you need to be um, uh, just plain and simple, giving people value. I think what people want channels where they can learn first and then be entertained second. Not everybody. I'm talking mainly about the photographic community now, of course. My my sons don't want to learn anything. They just want to see people falling over banana skins at the moment. That's their that's their that's their YouTube interest. <laughs> but for most photographers, I think it's learning first. It's education first, and then ent- entertainment second. And let let's um, uh, we've used him before, and he's it's a cliche but classic example of this. Peter McKinnon. Hmm. Okay, so he he made uh, a pile of films before he became successful, which did absolutely nothing, and they were basically da- diary vloggy pieces, weren't they? Mm. But then he made one which was kind of a nine nine tips kind of um, yeah. film, which, um, which went absolutely mad, didn't it? And yeah, it, and it it went viral, mm-hmm. and that launched him. And now he can do the entertainment stuff as well, which I think he's he's extremely good at doing. He's a brilliant YouTuber, brilliant. Yeah. But you be- his, his believability factor is boom, up there, isn't it? 10 out of 10. Yeah. Um, in fact, that one goes to 11. I think you're right about, um, you know, uh, we, you and I both struggle with getting time to put things on YouTube and your production values are far greater well, consistency than Consistency was the other consistency, thing. Consistency, yeah. 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 Um, but absolutely, you need to, uh, it, it, even though we've just been, we've just come back from the code of ego, YouTube <laughs> isn't an ego thing. It shouldn't be, uh, you know, it shouldn't really be used as a mechanism to advertise yourself or to kind of show off or anything because, the, I mean, you can do that, but well, it won't yeah. get that many views. Yes, yes. It's you know, I think you say like, what, what? Where's the first thing, place you photography aside? Where's the first place you go when you've got a question about something? Absolutely. How to do something? Yeah, yeah. You know, I, my, we, we changed the washer on our tap thanks to YouTube. Yeah, exactly. We'd have Absolutely. had to call you know call a plumber before that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, quite right. Um, Sorry, so, plumbers. So yeah, but that's 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 the way it is. So YouTube, the most popular um, first two words on on Google on YouTube search are. Mm, don't know. How to? How to? Are they? Yeah. Okay. How to? They're the fir- they're the most popular two words. Also, oh, if you if you want to make a title for your video, how to get the best out of your twenty three mil? Yeah. Think about what people actually question, and then do it. But the the key thing here, once you once you've got the idea for your film, is to make the production re- as reasonably good as you can. Yeah. You know, sitting down, da- slouching down in the seat with a completely messy r- bedroom behind you with the blinds closed, and you know all of that stuff, and yeah. you know just a little bit of effort. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I often. 
and you know I try and have a haircut and you know, <laughs> what at the same time trim my fingernails <laughs> and all that stuff. Um, but no, honestly, it makes a massive difference. And audio, of course, is the is is the killer thing. Um, audio is really right. in, audio is really important. We've talked about audio so many times. Yeah, I mean, get, getting that right. People will forgive you for the pictures being slightly off if the audio is good. And the, the other thing is, if you if you want to do a YouTube channel about photography, show pictures. Yeah, yeah. There's so many. There's so many channels out there where they just spend time jabbering on about other photographers, and uh, you know some of those channels are very successful. So I'm not. Yeah. I'm not saying that they're they're not successful, but you know, it's. I, um, I feel like if I'm going to be taught, if I'm reviewing a camera, mm. I should be showing pictures I've taken with that camera. Uh, you know, so many people also do reviews of cameras they've never touched. Mm. What do I think of the? Yeah, that's Fuji because they want they want the hits. G- GFX seventy four three seven two nine, and they've never even seen it or touched it. On the thing about um, about the ego thing. Uh, nobody goes onto YouTube because they are monk-like in their approach um, to to uh, to help. Well, some Bring some people, Mishi. some Mishi yeah, the Mishi the monk, he would have, yeah, he would. But you know, there's a little bit of showbiz and everybody that goes to do a YouTube channel. There has to be. Yeah. You're not you're not going on there because you're a shrinking violet. But but it, it is important to be uh, cer- certainly to be a- approachable and and n- not come across as someone that's. And and also I don't and this is something that you know we all struggle with. You will put people who put YouTube videos together and do them well. And I'm not necessarily including myself in that, but I'm certainly including you, Neil, in that. Will put an extraordinary amount of time and effort into it. Too much. Um, for <laughs> about two pound fifty in yeah, yeah. in uh, revenue from <laughs> Google. Yeah, it makes no commercial sense. It makes no commercial <laughs> sense unless you get to them um, uh, until yeah. it takes off. And, and and you know it's hard work, isn't it? You know I was thinking I was in the bath the other night and uh, I was looking at the tattoo I have on my hand. Oh, no. And it says, Stuff That Works. Oh, I like that tattoo. Yeah, yours. it says yeah. Stuff That Works. Yeah. And it's for different... That's the, is that the only tattoo you have? No, I have a dragon as well. Oh, Welsh dragon, yeah. I'm not Where's sure. that one? I'm not telling you. Oh. Um, warning, warning. <laughs> I, I, um, but, but, you know, I was, I was contemplating life and, you know, the challenges ahead for this year and everything. Yeah. And I was, I was thinking glad, about your four o'clock photograph, glancing at the tattoo. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking, you know what? That's that's got to be the mantra. Do stuff that works. Stop mm. doing stuff that doesn't work. We you, we have a choice, right? You have a choice. Everything is is a choice. And those two choices are, um, you know, the decision you're going to make is either going to be successful or mm-hmm. it's not going to be successful. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's very little area for grey middle ground there Mm. you know when it comes to whether you're going to you know in the context of of YouTube channel if you're going to build a YouTube channel you have to go at it with the the mentality that it's going to be successful you know the you can see the negativity in some people and that in order for it to be successful it's going it's probably the biggest and hardest job is building a successful YouTube channel neither of ours are successful in that respect you know we get we we put nice stuff up there and you've got quite a few subs now yeah i got quite a few subs i get 125 quid a month from google that's yeah. not success <laughs> that's definitely not success yeah but stuff that works and success is not always because you enjoy i know you enjoy doing it and i enjoy making films i it will it will not make me money well um, no 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 but it, it should eventually that's the point i i enjoy doing them but for stuff sure. that does stuff that works mean uh, is that that doesn't have to be totally um ring fenced by the fact that it's commercial stuff no, that no, works no. could be because you feel yeah like you really sort of you achieve something by putting that film that you've edited it you've made it it's yeah. up there people are watching it and yeah, let's be yeah, honest yeah. you know uh, somebody the other day said said to me I'd, I'd made a couple of films which were i think rather negative to be honest and, and when i look back at the titles we used it on the fuji cast as well he's mm-hmm. wedding photography dead and i thought I, I'm, I'm i'm wondering if half of me wasn't thinking clickbaity in, the, in that respect mm. but uh, somebody said uh, did make a comment was well, only got 1000 views you must be you know re- really upset about that and i thought you know what if i was in this if i was in a theater mm. and 1000 people were sat in in front of me mm. i'd be absolutely blown away by that. yeah absolutely no 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 i mean don't get me wrong i'm not all i'm saying is it's not it's to build a youtube channel you should have objectives you should have uh, you know unless you've got money to throw away and you just want the experience of doing it it's it's going to be a drain it's going to be a financial drain and an effort mm. um however saying that you know you it, it, it's a it's a long it's a long ball strategy youtube absolutely yeah. has to be yeah uh, there's I, very few people that just go bang straight away with it i enjoy doing it i get a lot of very positive comments from you it do. for sure you do. but if truth be told i'm only doing it because i hope one day that the the channel will you know will get big enough to you know maybe knock off one wedding a month you know mm. cover the, the the price of a wedding a month um you know and and for that I'm, you need to be looking at 150 200 000 subscribers and that's a lot a lot yeah. 
but you're right it does give you you know like uh i've got you've got a video how many that one your x pro uh, xt3 canon one has got how many uh, views now about 170,000 maybe more 170 that's yeah. that's wembley stadium twice that's that's everybody in wembley stadium times two um, i was very happy with that and then the, i made the one about the um oh the the stunt actress oh I yeah think that's got even more than that yeah in fact it is it's i think close to one of my first million ones wow not on my channel, oh. on somebody else's channel. And somebody pointed it out to me. <laughs> well, did they just take it off yeah, your channel? Yeah, Have yeah. you not? I would get that right down. No, because I allowed people to download and use, didn't I, I think? Or something like that. Uh, anyway. we, we should touch up. More for me. Yes. Um, Ian James, no relation. I've kind of, um, I'm kind of sorted where I stand with this, but I thought it may be worth bringing up so that I, I, other people, either in your Facebook group or by emailing in, can ask questions or say they're too pennyworth on the subject of... IR35. Um, now, um, Ooh, which, will mean, which will mean nout to our American and Australian listeners and many Europeans, of course, so we won't spend too long on it. But what is I-35 and how will it affect freelance photographers? There we go. Can of worms for you. Love, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> so there are two main types of workers who may be affected by this, okay? Independent contractors, we know that. Mm -hmm. Self-employed people providing services for a limited company, things like that, yeah? Mm -hmm. And freelancers, mm -hmm. similar to independent contractors, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um it doesn't matter what sector or industry you're in. Um, I got this bit from accountsportal.com. There's a very good piece on there about it. If you're an independent contractor or freelancer, you may be affected. IR35, though, will not affect you if you fall into the following areas. You're a permanent employee or you're a temporary employee providing services direct to a business or via a staffing agency. I've mm -hmm. got that right, haven't I? Mm, and they yeah. have got that right. So how, how does IR35 affect the common day photographer? Well... So I uh, hang on a sec. Are you, are you all comfortable? Yeah, this, is, this might we're going to try and might make take some time as succinct as we can for you. So uh, when I am back in the world of uh, uh, of uh, my IT days, during I used the to, war, during the war, I used to be a uh, contractor, yes. um, an IT contractor, and everything was great. We would invoice every week to um, so we weren't with an agency. We were directly to the bank or whoever we were working for. We'd invoice them every week, mm -hmm. and that was it. They would just pay you. Now uh, all of a sudden, this thing came along called IR thirty five, and it came. It came like this massive shadow mm. in the sky, and everybody was yeah. looking over their shoulder at yeah. it. So, IR35, Inland Revenue Directive 35, was essentially saying that if you are a contractor or an independent worker, but you only work or you mainly work for just one client, mm -hmm. then your tax, your dividend tax mostly, um, allowances would not be applicable. And also, on the flip side, the company that you are uh, supplying your services to would be um uh, would be responsible for things like sick pay PAY national insurance mm -hmm. PAYE um holidays um, paid holidays etc so this directive was essentially to stop people who are uh, used to you know had a full-time job with a company got made redundant and then went back as a contractor and did exactly the same thing um because that effectively wiped up a whole load of tax for the government all right and that, and and it's a fair it was a, it's actually a fair tax it's you know it's a we should all pay our taxes and it's it it's a fair it was a, it was a way of cheating the system if you like and so they put something in place for yes. it now uh from a photography point of view i don't know i guess if you are a photographer and you're uh, an independent company and you only have one main client so if you're doing all your work for a corporate identity the same company yeah and not through an agency you should be on their payroll not through an agency yeah. you might be uh affected by this yes yes absolutely um and it's worth double checking with your accountants um presumably there's very few photographers but if you're like a this. wedding photographer working for 30 40 50 oh, God, no, 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 yeah, no, no, it's not no, going to affect you at all not at all this this is likely to be <clears throat> commercial photographers who have got a long-term gigs with yeah. an independent company and there's no agency involved and then that's that's the likelihood of it what if yeah. you're a second shooter working for one photographer mainly okay you might have another couple but let's say that photographer has 35 weddings a year mm -hmm. and you've second shot with them for 28 mm -hmm. arbitrary figure plucked out the air I would suspect that those people who are second shooting have other jobs and other, uh, you know, op, you know, they, they're probably doing other work as well. Um, so I don't, I, I very much doubt it would be an issue. Okay. It might be worth double. If you are a second shooter who only works for one person exclusively, then it might be worth double checking. But I wouldn't be losing too much sleep. Over right. That. So that's IR35 sorted. Kev says don't lose too much sleep. 
Yeah, and I got, need, which I I did lose a lot of sleep over it once. But if you need uh, legal um, uh, any legal advice on that, then we suggest you go take that <laughs> <laughs> because Absolutely. you'll find that a lawyer is probably more expert on that than than we are. Are you ready for a photo disaster just to end this week? Yes. Here we go. <laughs> Beth L. Oh, by the way, if you're sending these in, click at fujicast.co.uk is the address. Um, Beth L., please hold the hold of my surname. All right. Uh, seems the guys were a little slow in coming forward with their disaster story, so I'm going to offer one up. In fact, not just one, but three. Here's a challenge to the men to, to come and share their steel, as it were. Uh, three years ago with a 5D2, I was working at a wedding and employed the use of a remote trigger. Have you ever used a remote trigger? Very good. Yeah, I have actually, I think, for yeah. um, long exposure I stuff. don't mean trigger off uh, only fours. <laughs> he was funny, wasn't he? All right, Dave. What do they call you, trigger? <laughs> no. <laughs> and then what do they call you, Dave? Dave? But they call you, oh, Dave. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, sorry if you've never watched that. You're thinking, what the hell are they talking about? What I didn't figure was the vicar backing into my tripod. In slow motion, I watched my beloved camera fall to the floor from the back of the church. Bang. Boom. Everything smashed. I asked the vicar of the church had insurance. He simply raised his eyebrows at me. <laughs> <laughs> Probably <laughs> substantially hairy eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> Second one, a couple of years back, on a portrait shoot. Quite a well-to-do client, nice house, nice big dog, which took a liking to my leg as I was shooting some portraits around the pool. I didn't take a tumble into the pool, but my shoulder bag did, with my 50mm 1.2 L-series lens. Ouch, that's an expensive one. <laughs> and last one, last year, 2019, another portrait shoot, no dogs, no pool. Uh, but this time, armed with my brand new X-T3. See, it's all come around to the Fuji film at the end. I did the shoot, left happy that I got a good session until I stopped to get some fuel. I left my camera bag on show in the front seat. Unlocked. You guessed it. I returned, no bag, no camera. It had been a long week and it was a moment of madness. The third one, though, ends on a happy note. I'd heard stories of uh, bags going missing, so I always separated my cards from my bag following the shoot. Well, wise. I'm so pleased I did, as that day, the shoot yielded one of the biggest spends I've enjoyed on a shoot, which uh, which paid for the camera, two lenses, and the bag, and then some. And not only that, I received a commercial commission from that shoot too, which has become a very strong client in the banking sector. Yes, we make mistakes, yes, we have bad days, but if you keep striving and working, you too can turn even the worst day into a best day. That's a nice end to the story there. Stuff that works. Oh, Stuff that works. Stuff that works. Thank you. If you'd like to send them in, click at fujicast.co.uk. We appreciate all the, the emails that you send in. And that's it for uh, for another week. Have we got everything done? We did disaster. We did book, didn't we? Just I, some, I need to check sometimes. I'm not sure that we've covered everything, but we have. Thank you. Uh, if you've liked this week's uh, show, thank you. And you can, of course, if you feel it's relevant, we'd love you to leave a review. Not all podcast apps have a review option or feature, but uh, those that do, especially Apple Podcasts, this really helps us reach like-minded people and builds a community which keeps us in these here seats, by the way. You can either leave a review. Have you tried this, by the way, Kev, within the podcast player? app or you can pop this link into your browser oh i've added the menu item have you added it on the website it oh, says leave us a review oh so if you go to the website fujicast.co.uk you can see rate this podcast.com forward slash fujicast yeah and it helps you leave well, a review. i've just put a menu at the top so click on rate uh, leave a review and then it'll go there. straight to that yes yeah. okay uh, see in the facebook group for any questions that you have um, really, our, our moderator Stephen Peter are in there too with their, their, their shiny FIFA referee tops on if it all gets a bit juicy in there. But uh, you really are the lifeblood of the show by Steve, sending us questions. Steve, of course, is the uh, um, photographer of the year. Oh, yes. We forgot Locksley. to mention that a couple yes. of weeks ago. Yeah, Locks. Well done, Steve. Well done, Steve. And Sam. And Sam. Round of applause. <laughs> no jingle. Sorry, I need to add one of those. Anyway, thank you for your questions. Uh, they are the lifeblood of the show. Everything stops quicker than Kev's diesel Kia <laughs> with a tank load of unleaded that Gemma accidentally put in the other day, if you don't. Send questions in to click at fujicast.co.uk. Music from Blue Wednesday. Supporting music from uh, the incredible artlist.io. And if you'd like to uh, grab a hold of our links and, and find out more about uh, our websites and things that we do, uh, Bebop will tell you. Learn about the kit Neil and Kevin use. Get links to all all their websites and find out first about any new workshops coming up by going to www. 
futurecast.co.uk forward slash the boys. And we will see you next week. Bye bye. And now the bits that didn't make the show. Kevin notes a few. A few Kevin. Right. Ke- <laughs> Kev. Kevin. Um, ah! I would imagine when you're in the room. Oh! Okay. Louis entered the room. I'm going to unplug that bloody thing. <laughs> <laughs> you're like the Beckhams. <laughs> And now you're like, oh, you're like uh, let's have our very own David. If there are some people I would not want to be, it's them. What is that <laughs> noise? Yeah, it's an aeroplane or something. No, it's, they're doing the... Ah, oh, once a week he does the b***y <laughs> lawns. Oh, no. It's all right, we'll just have to go through it and we'll mention it as a joke. Why next door neighbour? Today with the lawns. Another day. Right, Kev, I'm over it. Let's just go for it. The Fujicast is an independent Loading Zone production. Email the show with your questions and words of wisdom to click at fujicast.co.uk. Email any complaints and political nonsense to our wives who will deal with your comments in their own good time and in their own good way.